Hello, thanks for joining us today. My name is Jonathan Johnson. I'm the Chief of Pediatric Cardiology here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. We're here to discuss an area of active interest in our field, and that is valve disease in our single ventricle patients. I'm joined today by two of our great congenital heart surgeons. First, Dr. Joseph Draining, who's the Chief uh, Director of Congenital Heart Surgery here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I'm also joined by Dr. Elizabeth Stevens, who is one of our congenital heart surgeons who has a particular interest in neonatal um, and single ventricle heart disease. Um, as a background for this discussion, Dr. Draney, I'm wondering if you can summarize the, uh, the, staged, uh, the three stages of palliation for these patients. Sure, it's great to be here and to be talking about such a timely, important topic. So uh, patients that are born with one pumping chamber instead of two typically uh, go through a series of three operations before they get to the final operation, the Fontan operation, which is uh, what you're referring to. And the first operation involves uh, some type of a shunt where we carry uh, blood flow uh, to the lungs to get oxygen, which is converted to a different type of uh, shunt at about three months of age. We call this the Glenn procedure. And then finally, the Fontan procedure is usually done somewhere between two and four years of age, depending upon patient size and, 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 and so forth, so that all of the blood flow going to the lungs to get oxygen goes directly to the lungs and never actually goes to the heart at all. And, uh, and so this is really, there's a number of lesions that have one pumping chamber. Uh, and so everything that we're gonna talk about now could apply to any of those patients. Dr. Stevens, I'm wondering if you could discuss the importance of valve function in these single ventricle patients. Well, recent research has indicated that valve failure was highly associated with Fontan failure. And in fact, half of the patients with valve failure had Fontan failure versus a quarter percent who, a quarter uh, of the patients who did not. So we're learning that valve function and valve failure is really important for these Fontan patients. And Dr. Draney, I'm wondering how widespread is valve disease in these patients? Are there certain patients, certain anatomical um, uh, areas that have a particular higher risk? Sure, well, there could be a number of different anatomic abnormalities that could adversely affect the Fontan circulation. The valve that we're talking about inside the heart is probably one of the most important ones. And when that valve is not working properly, it really creates a poor Fontan circulation. And there are uh, different types of valve anatomy that tend to be more durable and last longer. And there are other valve anatomy types that are sort of performing in this side of the circulation where it wasn't initially intended. And they tend to uh, be more vulnerable to wearing out, resulting in usually a leaky valve that makes things challenging uh, for us to uh, deal with. You know, in terms of what the frequency of it is, I mean, by 30 years of age, probably a third of patients or more will have a poorly functioning valve. And by 10 years of age, it's probably about 10%, could be even higher depending upon the specific anatomic defect we're talking about. So it's a real problem for us. Um, Dr. Stevens, how, how do we know how much is too much? How much regurgitation would require an intervention? And, and then as we think about these stages of palliation, what, when would you do a repair? Well, that is a matter of opinion, but based on our experience, we'd say once you get to moderate regurgitation, especially if there's ventricular or annular dilation, that should be intervened on. And we would say to do it at the Glenn stage or prior to the Fontan. Um, once you have ventricular dilation with regurgitation, that's a high risk for Fontan failure. So in those cases, we would advocate for doing a valve repair before the Fontan, monitoring the patient and ensuring that they're gonna be a Fontan candidate where the Fontan can last. In general, we're not doing valve repairs at the time of the Fontan. There are some circumstances where it's more minor or when it's a mitral valve with a specific structural lesion that we'll do at the time of the Fontan, but that's our general practice based on our experience. And Dr. Draney, what kind of techniques are we using now to repair these types of valves? And um, is there any time when a replacement's actually a better option? Well, fortunately, we have a long-standing history of both Fontan surgery and valve repair surgery. So we've, we've learned a lot through our own experience. Valve repair is always preferred uh, in general, particularly in children. And there are a lot of techniques that we have learned over the last 50 years uh, with valve repair techniques, bands, artificial strings, sewing, natural points of you know, cleavage or clefts together, uh, many techniques can be applied. Replacement is, is sort of an option. It's not, a, it's not a preferred option, but it is definitely an option. And in some circumstances, if a valve repair is, is predicted to be 
a poor result, then it may be it may be better to just proceed with valve replacement. But essentially, we would always begin with a valve repair and save replacement for a failed failure uh, before we we jump to uh, that strategy. Thank you. Um, Dr. Stevens, um, how do these patients do after they have a repair or a replacement? Well, not as good as we would have liked for the valve repair specifically. And depending on the study, it's anywhere from 40 to 60 percent will have a valve repair failure at two to four years. Oh. So this is definitely something that our specialty can work on. That said, those patients who do get a valve repair do better than similar patients with valve problems who don't get a valve repair. And we've also learned that when valve repair is successful, in other words, when that holds, they do as well as patients without valve issues. So um, this is obviously a, an area of uh, intense interest in improving. Um, the other thing that we've been learning more recently is the importance of ventricular function. So a recent study showed that if you had moderate dysfunction after the valve repair, three quarters of those patients either had um, required a heart transplant or ended up dying. So I think it's also important to take into account the ventricular function when we're caring for these patients and timing the valve repair. And thank you for bringing up transplant, which is actually a perfect segue to the next question. Is there any situations where transplant might actually be a, a strong consideration for some of these patients with single ventricle anatomy and AV valve disease? Yeah, that's a good uh, point. I think the transplant is in the discussion with Fontan circulation at some point for the majority of patients, hopefully not until well until the adult years. But the I think that what Dr. Stevens was referring to, the ventricular function, unfortunately, when you have a leaky valve, that sort of results in progressive depression in function of the ventricle. And both of these things can really be a challenge for us. And the timing of surgery before we have significant dysfunction is important if you want to get as much durability out of your valve repair as possible. And so transplant is something that it may be preferred during childhood if valve replacement is the only option. I think that that decision is individualized depending upon the specific anatomy, depending upon the function of the heart, depending upon other medical problems that the child may have, the social situation, access to medical care, uh, transplant is a wonderful solution, but it is not without its challenges too. And I think that uh, you have to balance the, the advantages and disadvantages of a conventional procedure uh, versus uh, resorting to transplantation. Thank you. Dr. Stevens, we've talked a little bit about some data and some new studies. Um, is there anything that these new studies are teaching us and perhaps ask you, how should we be approaching these patients in the next 10 to 20 years? Well, I think our approach has and should change based on these studies. And one is earlier intervention, so not waiting as long for the regurgitation to get worse or annular dilation and ventricular dilation to get worse. So that's a key point. And another is, as I mentioned before, consider staging before the Fontan to um, do the valve repair, see how the patient does, and make sure that they're going to be a good Fontan candidate um, before proceeding to the Fontan. And then lastly, I would say, even though I think as surgeons, we often think as think of valve replacement as a failure, in certain situations, you know, an early valve repair failure um, that goes down, a replacement actually might be the best option. So I think we need to think critically about each patient and consider whether valve replacement actually in that patient might be the best option for them. You know, as we think about this, um, it seems like such an important challenge for our patients. And I, I keep kind of being brought back to the idea that if we're trying to figure out the correct time for an intervention or operation, it's really going to take regular follow-up, regular imaging, really close, closely working with their cardiologists and their home physicians. And then also communication with you guys, the surgeons. You guys always have been great whenever I call. And I know we can have a good discussion about what the best thing to do for that patient is now or in a year or two or five. Um, but that communication and, and planning something out so that the first time you're not finding out about this is when we call and ask you for a surgical date. I'm wondering if you can comment on that at all. Uh, it's a very good point, uh, Dr. Johnson. The This group of, of problems, the single ventricle patients, really sort of bring together and emphasize the importance of a multidisciplinary approach. I mean, there's so many people that play a critical role uh, even beyond the surgeon and the cardiologist. I mean, people that are doing imaging, even the primary care physicians who are sort of doing the day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month follow up. Uh, everybody needs to be educated and everybody needs to communicate well so that the timing of surgery 
is really optimized. And we really, I think, as Dr. Stevens was alluding to, we want to get this all figured out before we get to the Fontan, ideally. And this can be frustrating for the parents when an extra operation or more is thrown into the equation before we even get to the Fontan. But mm -hmm. That is the nature of this beast, and it's uh, it's hard on everybody. We're getting better. We still have room to improve, uh, and I think we've we've summarized some of the improvements that we've learned to date. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, and and thank you to all of you for joining us.